And if Bitcoin has been in the news, it often has been in the news for some, someone would say the wrong reasons because it has um, been extremely volatile. So it's made the fortunes for some, it's also crashed and lost money of, of many. Do you think that this volatility is problematic? Is it here to stay? Or will Bitcoin become sort of behave more like a normal currency? Well, I mean, it's, it's a great question because that volatility does exist. You're absolutely right. Um, and it has been around for, well, pretty much since Bitcoin began. So, of course, traders love volatility because they can, um, they can make good money um, on that. But it's not very good, really, if you're talking about a currency, particularly if you want it to be a, a stable currency. Um, uh, but volatility, it does exist elsewhere because, I mean, if we look at the sell-off uh, recently in March, when this COVID-19 really started to bite, um, you know, you want to talk about volatility, look at, look at oil, for example, or, you know, silver lost a decade of its gains in, in, in just a few days. So, you know, volatility does exist everywhere, but you're right, it is, does exist more in, in Bitcoin. And the reasons for that really are that, you know, Bitcoin is a small market. It's only about 160 billion market cap. It sounds big, but in finance terms, you know, that's, you know, changed down the back of the sofa for these guys, really. It, it's tiny. And what that means is whenever there's a large sale or uh, something like, or a large purchase of Bitcoin, it can affect the price quite dramatically. So that volatility is really a factor of kind of big fish on a small pond. But here's the thing, that pond is growing all the time. Now, both in terms of the number of coins that are available and the number of people who are getting involved with Bitcoin. Remember, it's pretty small still. There's only about 50 million wallets in the world. So it's pretty early. So there's probably quite a few people here think they're late to the party with Bitcoin, but I can tell you you're not. It's, it's, it's still early days at the moment. Um, so that means this volatility is kind of emphasized by these numbers. Now, as time goes on and those, those numbers get bigger, we, do, we would expect that volatility to go away. So in the short term, the volatility is an issue for Bitcoin, I would say. It's not for me personally, because I'm thinking long term, but for people um, thinking shorter term, it, it can be an issue and it can be a barrier to get involved with it as well. But um, longer term, we would expect to see that go away almost completely, really. Well, I'm glad you talked about um, the concentration of Bitcoins in the ha in a few hands, because this is something I wanted to mention as well. So there is this idea that you have so-called, I think it's Bitcoin whales is the term, of you know, uh, individuals holding a very large number of Bitcoin influencing the market. As you said, it can also be positive aspect because um, as I think Paul Tudor Jones, the legendary macro trader said, if 50 million people own Bitcoin and you, know, you can expect far more in the future, you would have both maybe a reduction in volatility and an increase in price as more people, uh, there's more demand with a limited supply. But do you think that um, this manipulation of, Bitco of the price of Bitcoin um, by large holders is a problem that will not be solved soon? Um, well, again, it's a great question. But I mean, in terms of market manipulation, I mean, the first point I would make is that let's not pretend that market manipulation doesn't happen in pretty much every market because it, it does. I know it's not supposed to. And in very regulated markets, it's quite hard to do, but it, it does actually exist. It is easier with Bitcoin because um, it sits outside of that, of the existing financial system and the existing regulatory um, uh, rules as well. So, uh, and again, when I'm talking about Bitcoin, I am talking about the other cryptocurrencies here because you can freely trade the other cryptocurrencies. But again, it's just easy if we just stick with, with the main currency at the moment. So it, it does exist and it is a problem for the reasons I've explained because of these large holders. And we do call them whales because when they move, they make a big splash in, in, this, in this pond. But these these whales, to use that term, I don't like it very much, but I will, I will go with it for the moment. Um, they exist really because they were the very, very early adopters of Bitcoin. So in, it's been around since 2009, don't forget, and was born out of the last um, uh, recession, uh, which, of course, by today's standards, is, is going to go down probably as just a footnote, really, in, in history compared to what's going on now. Um, but it so it came from there, this, this new concept came along, these people got involved, and they kind of took the risk, I suppose, to get involved. 
And in those days, when you supported the network, you would be rewarded in very large numbers of Bitcoin, which of course had no value. But a lot of people kept these coins and over time the value increased and we're now sitting at something like nine and a half thousand dollars so some of these people are sitting on millions if not billions of dollars of bitcoin now and that's where they they came from so sometimes they do want to move some of those coins now when they do so of course if they do it in any significant volume it can cause price to drop and then the accusation is that they caused it to drop so they can buy it back uh, at uh, you know a better price effectively now personally I'm a little skeptical of that claim. I think it's a little bit more sour grapes from the smaller people. I mean, literally every time this happens, my Twitter feed fills up with people moaning about whales. It drives me mad a bit. Um, but it is a function of being involved in the industry at the moment. Um, and over time, again, that problem will reduce because we'll have fewer larger holders, we'll have more coins spread out over a large period, and of course, we'll have a higher price. I'm saying all this theoretically, don't take it as read that, you know, Bitcoin's going to be $1 million next year or anything like that. So I'll just have to clarify that. But in theory, economics, law, supply and demand, adoption, etc., we'd expect to see an increase in price, an increase in value, and of course, a decrease in volatility and the power of those large holders to, to manipulate the market that way. Well, we, we just talked about the um, market issues that you know, we can find sometimes in, in, in Bitcoin markets. But uh, we obviously should mention as well that if you look at debt markets in the present crisis, they basically freeze so that bonds became totally illiquid. And that's a huge market um, regulated, very much regulated and with uh, constant government supervision. So the same issues seem to be um, present in, all, in other markets as well. Uh, now, the present situation is particularly interesting for Bitcoin and crypto because of the role of central banks. So as we have seen in the last crisis, banks tend to try to prop up the economy uh, you know, by lowering rates. And when that does not, um, is not enough, they will print money in order to uh, keep uh, liquidity flowing. Um, now, this has taken unprecedented proportion in the present crisis. Mm -hmm. And because cash is unlimited, banks can print it literally. Um, this can be problematic if one uh, tries to keep you know cash uh, as a storehold of wealth so gold has done very well do you think that bitcoin could one day you know play the same role as gold or is it already playing the same gold, uh, role as gold because it cannot be printed well I, I love this question i'm smiling slightly because this is probably one of the questions that i have the most um discussions about particularly with gold bugs um, very often I do have, uh, you know, I'm on a panel and the, this, this, this question of store of value comes up and of course the gold bugs will say, no, it isn't a store of value. And the Bitcoin will say, yes, it is a store of value. Uh, and we go around in circles for about half an hour. Um, but so the, the question is, can Bitcoin really be used as a store of value? And my argument has always been yes. And actually it's already being used as a store of value. And there's a couple of good examples of this because if you look in countries like um, Venezuela or um, Argentina, where we've got a, you're probably aware there's a serious uh, inflation problem in these countries at the moment. And of course, if you're the man in the streets, where can you put your money? There's not much you can do because you're stuck with this currency. And what you try and do is find a hard currency like uh, the dollar, which is not quite as hard as it was now, of course, but it, it's, it's hard in comparison. But it's very hard to get dollars in countries like that. So you would look at other alternatives. Now, if you're an institution, you would you run to a safe haven like gold. But I don't know if you've ever tried buying gold as an individual. Um, and it's not easy, actually. Um, I'm not talking about going to a shop and buying it retail. I'm talking about buying it as a proper store of value. Um, it's expensive. You need to know the right people. Um, you need to pay for storage. The gold never generally moves anyway. It stays in one place and you just trade with the paper. Um, so it is problematic. Now, for the first time in history, particularly in the, just the last 10 years, the average man in the street now has a place to go to hedge against their own currency. And that's why we've seen big increases in Bitcoin purchasing in places like Argentina and Venezuela. And in fact, Interestingly, it's been going on in um, Venezuela for a couple of years now. Even if you bought Bitcoin at the highest value, there was a big boom a couple of years ago, Bitcoin brief, spikes briefly up to $20,000. And if you'd even bought it then in that country, you'd still be better off than if you just left your money in your native currency. So immediately to me, that is a store of value. 
So it's, we're here already. You'd argue perhaps it's not as stable or as, as, as secure, well, it's certainly as secure as gold, but it's not stable as gold, but it's going, it's going that way. And I think in years to come, Bitcoin really will be seen as a very excellent store of value. Well, if we can take that a little further, usually, um, you know, stores of value satisfy a set of four criteria. So one is liquidity. Uh, the second one is portability. The third one is trustworthiness. And the fourth one is purchasing power. So we briefly discussed purchasing power. Um, would you like to comment on the other three? Uh, well, okay. Well, let's take something like uh, liquidity. That was one of, one of yours, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, you would argue that the gold market is liquid. Um, because if I wanted to go out and buy some gold now, I could, I could easily buy some. If I wanted to sell it, someone would take it off my hands. Um, and in some ways, Bitcoin's you know, different. It's just, it's just a lot simpler because I can do that in real time from my mobile device and I don't have to go and find a broker or deal with anything else. So it, it's, it, it has a, a real advantage, I think, in, in that sense. But I suppose what really comes to its own is something like portability. So gold, you know, is not very portable. It, it's, it's a real pain to try and move it anywhere. Um, I mean, just ask the Venezuelan government, for example, having a bit of a ding-dong with uh, Bank of England at the moment because they want their gold and Bank of England is saying, can't have it. Um, so, you know, there are problems there. However, I can take my Bitcoin wherever I like on my phone and, and I can use it wherever I like. Even better, because I know what my seed key is, which is the sort of secret phrase that I can restore my Bitcoin from the, the system with, I could have everything taken away from me, literally everything, and I've still got all the Bitcoin, all my wealth really in my brain. And, you know, that is some serious possibility that gold is, 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 is difficult um, to, you know, compete with. Uh, and what was the other one? Trustworthiness? Trustworthiness is the final Yeah, okay. One. So, I mean, you know, when you think of gold, you do think of trust to some extent, but, you know, it... it it, it is not quite as trustworthy as you think. You, you may know, some of your um, viewers may know that uh, there are problems with gold counterfeiting. It's a big industry. Um, and you've got, even with the safeguards that exist right now, it, you can get caught out with gold. But because the way that Bitcoin works, and the reasons this are very technical and very mathematical, which I won't go into right now, it never crosses your mind whether the coins you're using are genuine or not. It just you don't even need to think about it because it is by the nature of what it is 100 percent trustworthy I and mean, we have seen a lot of initiatives in the commercial space based on bitcoin and if we follow up on that there are many students here who are probably very curious on you know the development of bitcoin either as a storehold of wealth or as even as a as a means of payment or a speculative um trading opportunity for that matter how do you think that they should get involved is there a specific way that you recommend they use to you know start with bitcoin uh, yeah i mean number one thing is 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 learn first of all and there is a lot of information out there a lot of it is is not that well informed i'll be honest with you it's still a little bit of a mess in certain places but if you go to sort of reputable sources um, and learn that way, there's one guy in particular I always mention, and there's a chap called Andreas on Antonopoulos. I can never say his name. I mean, years I've been following this guy and I still can't say his name correctly. But if you look it up, it's Andreas Antonopoulos. And uh, he uh, does a very good introduction to Bitcoin. He speaks very well about it, very eloquently. He wasn't involved the initial creation of it, but he discovered it early on because he's become a sort of spokesperson for it. So any video, um, he's on the, all over YouTube, he's, he's, some of his books are fantastic. Very nice guy, listen to his stuff and he will take you right from the basic, right as advanced you want to go. The other step I would say is to get involved. The easiest way to do this is, is just to take the leap and get involved and have a play with it. Um, it's a bit like when you first learn to drive. So you do, you do quite a lot of theory stuff, don't you? And um, you know, you've got to learn how the bits on the car work. And then the first time you turn the key, you put it in gear. And I'm sure everyone remembers that moment when you leave, release the clutch and this car starts moving, it's under your control for the first time. Now it is quite a scary moment. And then we get used to it and we end up reversing out of our driver 50 miles an hour with a piece of toast in our mouth, you know, a couple of years later. But that first moment is quite um, terrifying. But you have to do it yourself. You can't get anyone else to do it for you. You have to do it yourself. 
And I, it's an analogy I always use with Bitcoin. So in other words, the easiest thing to do is to get involved, get some Bitcoin and learn how it works and play with it. And this is um, in many ways where Luna comes in, particularly for, for today, because I'm, I'm not sure if you've made your um, colleagues aware, Max, but today I'm, I'm representing Luna today, um, which is an app you can get on your phone or any other device. You can download this app and this gives you a wallet and it's a place where you would keep your Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And Luna really acts as a gateway between the, the, the financial system that we know and we use every day and this kind of new financial system. So it's a gateway between the two. So you can transfer your, your fiat currency, your pounds, euros into Bitcoin, and then you can transfer it back again. But Luna has got certain other advantages because it has a very, very good learning portal built in. So if you're very new to Bitcoin, this is where you start. So you can download the app. You can find it now on, on you know, the App Store or the Google Play. I forget which ones. We'll forget the proper name for it now. And you can install it. You set it up like a banking app. So you need a couple of little bits of ID, the same as you would anything else. And then you're, you're good to go. And you can then use it to learn. And if, you, if, you're really, if you're really quite into Bitcoin, you, you know what you're doing with it, there is a more advanced version of the wallet as well. It's built in as well, but you can then look at exchanging between other currencies and doing other bits and pieces. So it's, it's a great little thing that works for both beginners and more advanced users. And I mentioned earlier, Max, that one of the biggest obstacles of getting started with Bitcoin is this kind of fear, this first step. It's that part where you release the clutch for the first time. So what Luno do is they say, right, well, we'll take care of that bit for you because we know how that feels. We're going to give you some Bitcoin free of charge to get you started that you can play with. So if you're worried about losing a bit of Bitcoin, and instantly that's quite difficult to do unless you do something very, very silly and do it on purpose, um, we will kind of finance your first step. So um, I thought I'd just mention that we can, I, can I give a code out to your, um, to your viewers? To, to yeah, yeah sure, feel free. We'll also share it with our audience afterwards, but feel free to do it now as well. Okay, so what the way this works now, if you download the app, you don't have to do it now, you can do it afterwards, but you can do it now if you want while you're watching this. Um, once you've done that, you'll see a section that says rewards, and there is a section where you can enter a code. And the code that you would enter, which is all capital letters, is P D U K. 9x so that's papa delta uniform kilo niner x-ray you would enter that in and luna will today give you 10 pounds worth of bitcoin um free of charge if you're in elsewhere in europe you can still set this up as well give you 10 pounds in your local currency um to get you started that'll be credited to your wallet immediately so if nothing else, you, you can be kind of cool and say, hey, I've got some Bitcoin. But it also now gives you a situation where you can play with this quite safely, knowing that you haven't had to put your own money in at this stage. And then later on, you're a little bit more confident. You'll find that you can just easily buy more or transfer it back or whatever you want to do or use some of the other services. And I, I strongly recommend you do this because I think it's a great offer from Luno. And um, you know, I'm very proud to actually be able to present this today because I think it's a really good opportunity to get started really on someone else's dime and uh, get rid of those early, early nerves. So yeah, so that code again is PDUK9X.